Well, our theme for 2024 is possessing the land. And last year, I preached a series on 1 Corinthians entitled The Spirit-Filled Church. And it was about this church in the Gentile world living at the intersection of spiritual reality and one of the darkest places on earth. And then a year later, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthian church again. And Paul's encouragement to the Corinthian church is not just to be filled with the Spirit, but to release the Spirit. We don't just live in spiritual reality. We bring spiritual reality to bear in every situation in which we find ourselves. We carry the presence of God with us like we're going to do at this concert and every day to change the atmosphere (laughs) with the presence of the Holy Spirit. So we began this series by saying that we are released to comfort, to bring the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Last week we heard that we are released to shine, to shine brighter, to shine bolder, to shine like the stars forever. And this week's passage, we are in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and the first part of chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, oh, there are so many verses in there that if you haven't already memorized, you really should. There are so many powerful statements about living at the intersection of spiritual reality and the natural world. You know, as Christians, we should be noticeably different from the world around us, even while we're trying to blend in. Paul called us ambassadors Citizens of heaven, but living in and representing spiritual reality in the earth. We're part of God's new creation, who are working with him to transform the old creation. So we're going to learn what it means to be in the world, but not of the world. Because we represent the kingdom of God in this world. So if you're following along in your outline, uh, which is in your bulletin, or for those of you online, there's an e-bulletin that you can access. The first part of the message is this. We are citizens of heaven. We're citizens of heaven. So most of you know that my first ministry assignment was in the country of Denmark, where I lived for almost four years. I learned the language. I used public transportation. I still like to spread blue cheese, fresh blue cheese on a warm roll and eat that for breakfast. Um, I've learned to eat uh, pickled herring and uh, pork liver pate, little pastai, the legget, the my legget, the Danes would say. You know, I tried as much as I could to be like the Danes, but you know, I was never really one of them. I didn't have the same upbringing. Danes are used to thinking as a group. They call it groupthink. You know, everybody just kind of like has the same idea at the same time. You know, they do everything together. But being an American, I'm used to thinking as an individual. And when they're doing their group thing, groupthink thing, I'm thinking, you know, I want to do something else. Not because I'm rebellious, but because I'm American. And that's the way we think. The Danes value comfort and a quiet life. I was programmed with ambition and the drive to be successful. So here I am sharing all of my ideas and my vision with my Danish friends, and they're like, relax. You seem uptight. Have some coffee. Have some cake. You're too stressed. (laughs) I don't want to hear about your ideas if they're going to stress you out like that. So after spending some time in Denmark, I can say that who I am rubbed off on some of my Danish colleagues, but they also influenced me. And we still have traditions in our family that go all the way back to our time in Denmark. So why do I share that illustration? Well, I want to ask this question. What does it mean to you that you are a citizen of heaven? How does the culture of heaven impact your life here on earth? 
Do you find that the way you are, the way you believe, sometimes clashes with the way the rest of the world thinks? Do you ever feel out of place? <laughs> like you live here, you speak the language, you eat the food, but you'll never really completely belong here. Paul had talked about enduring suffering and hardship and that we have the comfort of the Holy Spirit. He, he said that even though the world can be a dark place, we shine as lights. But now he's talking as if this world really isn't even our home because we have another home waiting for us. And here's the first fill in the blank, if you're following along. Our bodies are not permanent. Our bodies are not permanent. Let's start reading in 2 Corinthians 5. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. So our earthly bodies are called a tent. But our heavenly existence is called a building or a house. What is he trying to say? Our bodies are not permanent. <laughs> you know, we... We spend a lot of time in these things, and we kind of get attached to them, don't we? <laughs> we tend to think of our physical existence, our physical realities, that those are the things that are solid, those are the things that are substantial, and spiritual realities, well, that's, that's kind of like air. That's like a wisp of nothing. But Paul is emphatically saying that just the opposite is true. Spiritual reality is even more real than our natural world. So we know and understand physical realities. We know our bodies. We get very attached to them. But many people think that when their bodies fail, that they're going to somehow cease to exist. And Paul already addressed this in 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 35 to 38, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life until it dies, or unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. So if you've heard me preach at a funeral, you've probably heard this text because this is my favorite funeral text. Our physical existence is just a seed of what we are becoming. And don't become too attached to it because it's not going to last forever. <laughs> but you will last forever in an even greater form. And that's the next fill in the blank. The physical is surpassed by the spiritual. Let me pick up in verse 4. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we, we, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared for us this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. So the popular conception of death is that our body is a container for our spirit. And that once our body dies, the little spirit inside is released like a little naked bird. Just having shed the confines of its cage, it flies away. But that's not what Paul is saying here. Paul would take us back to the image of a seed. 
The Spirit is not just a part of us released in death, but it is in death that the real self emerges through death. So in the seed image, the little seed is naked until it takes on its true form, and only after shedding its tiny little shell is it clothed with the greater reality of who it is. 1 Corinthians 15.46 says, However, the spiritual didn't come first, but the natural precedes the spiritual. The natural comes first, but it's only a forerunner, only a predecessor to a greater spiritual reality. 1 Corinthians 15, 42 and 43 say, So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, but what is raised is imperishable, greater. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory, greater. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power, much greater. So right now, while in your physical body, you have the Holy Spirit living in you, but your physical body is just a tent or a seed. And what you experience of the Holy Spirit is called a deposit. <laughs> so your walk with God right now and everything that you are experiencing of the Holy Spirit is really just a down payment on what you have to look forward to in eternity. And some of us have treated our down payment from God as if that's all we are ever going to get. <laughs> like we feel like we need to budget our spiritual inheritance. Let's not get too excited. You know, we, we want God's grace to last until we die. Right? If we get too spiritual, he might take us home early. <laughs> You know, when we think or talk like that, we show we really don't get it. We really don't get it at all. There's a, a great quote, and I, I was able to find this. A guy by, I'm going to butcher his name, Pierre Teilhard de Hardin, a French priest, okay? Years back, he says, You are not a human being in search of a spiritual experience. You are a spiritual being immersed in a human experience. How about that? What if we thought of ourselves as spiritual beings first and our humanity as second or temporary? Is that a strange thought? You know, it wasn't so strange to Paul. This is the next fill in the blank. Heaven is our true home. Heaven is our true home. Picking up in verse 8. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are, what we really are, is known to God. And I hope it is known also to your conscience. So heaven is our home, our true home, and our body is merely a tent. <laughs> that means what we normally call home is not. Heaven is. But most of us would say, you know, I've never been to heaven. So how is that my home? Well, my children had never been to Denmark until in 2017, after their mother passed away, we took a family trip to Denmark in her memory and her honor. My oldest daughter was born in Denmark. She was there until she was about a year and a half. She doesn't remember it. 
But while she was there, there were a lot of things that felt familiar to her. In fact, all of the kids found things about Denmark familiar. But even though they had never been there, there were parts of that place, parts of that culture that had been part of our home, part of our family life. Do you know how I know you are going to be at home in heaven? Because we have been practicing the culture of heaven while living in our tents here on earth. And you have a deposit of the Holy Spirit right here in your earthly tent. And what you are now, who you are now, is just the beginning of who you are becoming. That's the next portion of Scripture. We are examples of new creation. So last week we noted that God created light out of darkness. And just as he created light out of darkness, he calls us to shine forth his light. And that light creates life. And when God created the world, the earth became alive and began to teem with all sorts of living creatures. Let me read to you from Genesis 1, verses 20 to 22. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures. Let the birds fly above the earth, across the expanse of the heavens. You getting the picture here? (laughs) Things just propagating and coming forth. And God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves and with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the waters in the seas and let the birds multiply on earth. So God is still multiplying his goodness on earth, except this time it's to restore the earth. Earth had been infected with sin and and was cursed, and death and darkness have spread on earth. But what God is doing in and through people like you and people like me is he's creating all over again. New creation. So how do we participate in new creation? This is the next fill in the blank. New life emerges through, guess what? Death. Life emerges through death. Let's pick up in verse 12. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about the outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. And if we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Remember what Paul said about the seed? Before it becomes what it was really meant to be, it has to die. And only after it dies does it assume its true form. Crazy, right? Nobody wants to die. (laughs) You know, we don't even like to think about dying, let alone talk about it. Paul anticipates that they're going to think he's crazy talking like this. And Paul comes back with this. He says, you know what? I don't care because I'm already dead. When Jesus died on the cross, my spiritual life changed at that moment. So let's try this. I know this this, this is getting a little heady here, but let's try to think outside of time and space, like spiritual beings for whom time is irrelevant. One moment changed all of history. Think like you are a time traveler 
and a story. Carrie and I like to do sci-fi sometimes, and they always do, they do these things like alternate dimensions and time travel and stuff like that. So think like you're a time traveler in a story, and you go back in time and you witness some important event. Except while you're there, you happen to interact with someone you know or something that you do may seem inconsequential, but it impacts future events and changes the whole course of history. So that once you arrive back in your own place and time, you find that everything you once knew is changed by that event. Okay, I basically just described the plot of Back to the Future, okay, right? So this is how Paul is looking at his own life through Jesus' death and resurrection. All of that changed history, and our lives most certainly included. He writes in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Yeah, I see somebody else has it memorized. As spiritual beings, we participate in the death of Christ so that we can also participate in his life. And it's that process of death and rebirth by which we have become a new creation. In Christ, the fallen, sinful world is ending and a new, restored world is beginning. And when we view our lives through that one event, everything changes. And here's the next fill in the blank. We are a different kind of... Of creature. We're a different kind of creature. Let me pick up in verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So when you think of your life as viewed through the cross, the resurrection, and God's eternal plan, you know, it, it changes everything. It changes the way you see yourself, and it changes the way you see other people as well. Turn to your neighbor and say, you know, is it just me or is there something different about you? Right? <laughs> Maybe they changed their hair. Maybe they just look better in fall colors. Maybe they didn't do anything today except put on a smile. Do you know what really makes the difference? Jesus makes the difference. And when that light shines and the Holy Spirit comes in, new creation is the result. In fact, you've heard me say in this verse, it it, it says, behold, new creation. There's no verb in the Greek. So it creates this kind of like pow sort of effect. Like new creation just appears out of nowhere. You become a new person. Not just on the outside, but on the inside. And it starts on the inside, but then it changes the outside. And that's why Paul says, look, behold, the new has come. Look, it's arrived. You're different. You're new. What you see happening in you is a gift from your creator. Jesus reversed the curse by his own death. He took your sin on his own body and nailed it to the cross. And now you are reconciled to God. Restored to light. Restored to life. Restored, renewed, repopulating God's goodness on this earth. And Paul calls us agents of reconciliation. God's ambassadors. And that's the next fill in the blank. 
we are changed to change the world. We're changed to change the world. Picking up in 2 Corinthians 5, 19. That is, God was re- Christ, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You know, if you came across a product or a service that really changed your life, made you healthy when you were sick, made you wealthy when you were poor, made you smart when you were not smart, (laughs) made your life meaningful, well-ordered, and worthwhile, I know Alan's sitting there like, I have such a product right now. (laughs) Would you become a spokesperson for that product or service? Absolutely you would. It would be hard not to. Why? Because you would want to tell everybody about the product or service that changed your life. Right? Well, that's what happens when Jesus changes your life. You become a spokesperson, an ambassador for Jesus. And you don't need a title. You just need a testimony. What has Jesus done for you? You know, we did this a few years back. I encouraged everyone to practice sharing their testimony. We even did some practicing in Sunday school. You know, you should have a long version and you should have a short version. And be ready to share the short version whenever someone asks you what is different about you. <coughs> Excuse me. 1 Peter 3.15 says, Honor Christ and let him be Lord of your life. Always be ready to give an answer when someone asks you about your hope. That's the short version of your testimony. And if they hear you out and want to know more, well then you have the longer version. But it simply starts with seeing yourself as God sees you. That begins to change you into his image, who he really created you to be. And as you change, you simply share Jesus with people who notice the change. And be sure to let them know that whatever God did for you, he'll do for them. That's it. That's the strategy. You think we can do that? (laughs) Here's the third part of this message. We are in the world, but not of it. In the world, but not of it. So, you know, when people look at us, they probably think we're just like them. Or maybe they don't. In a way we are, in a way we're not. We are just like them apart from Jesus, right? But Jesus makes all the difference. And it's time to let them know about that difference. Here's your next fill in the blank. The time for transformation is, can you fill in the blank? Now. Now. The time for transformation, we didn't even read this and you know it already. How is that? Let's pick up in chapter 6. Working together with him then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is a favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way, so no fault may be found with our ministry." So there's a quotation in this passage, Isaiah. It comes from Isaiah. Isaiah prophesied about a hundred years before the exile that Israel had become corrupt and that they would face judgment. 
He prophesied the Assyrian invasion and he prophesied the Babylonian exile long before they happened, like a hundred years long before they happened. But he also prophesied the restoration of Israel. And there are some key prophecies in Isaiah which point to Jesus as the Messiah. When Isaiah spoke of an appointed time for restoration, he had been prophesying judgment, and he was speaking about a time of restoration that would come after that judgment. Let me take you to Isaiah 49, verse 8. This is what the Lord says, At just the right time, I will respond to you. On the day of salvation, I will help you. I will protect you and give you the people as my covenant with them. Through you, I will reestablish the land of Israel and assign it to its own people again. So Paul quotes this promise given by Isaiah and says, we are living in that promise. Now is the time of restoration. The exile, the time of judgment is past, and we are living in the time of restoration. You don't have to wait for all of these other promises to be fulfilled before this one also comes to pass. It's here, and now is the time. Now, you know, we look back on this scripture as people who have been living in the now time for generations. And what does that say to us? I would call it a how much more than argument. You heard me use that term before. If Paul was proclaiming the now time, then we are living in the it's about time. Right? There was never a better time to receive God's grace and participate in his restoration of the world than now. And it's about time. We may be getting very close to the, oops, you're out of time. Here's the next fill in the blank. We can then reframe, reframe our circumstances. Carrie's smiling. This is a counselor thing. We love to help people reframe their circumstances. Picking up in verse 4. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance in afflictions, hardship, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, and then he shifts by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech, and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. You know, when you know who you are in Christ, what we have already said changes you. It changes the way you see others, and you know, it also changes the way you see your circumstances. Paul is speaking as a servant of God, commissioned to change the world, and he's declaring that the time for transformation is here. It's now. And what happens to him? All hell breaks loose. He comes with a powerful anointed vet message, and he gets slammed with opposition. How many of you have experienced that? But when you are a spiritual person, you recognize what's happening. This is spiritual warfare. Of course we're going to get hit. We're in a war. Like the soldier who wrote home and said, Mom, they're shooting at us. You know? Guess what? That's what you signed up for. We're in a spiritual battle, and you have just declared war on the enemy. And the opposition that you are encountering is a spiritual resistance to the plan and the purpose of God. So what do you do with that? Well, you put it in perspective. Remember who you are and what Jesus has done for you. 
press into the Holy Spirit as your source and respond to that resistance with the fruit of the Spirit. You see how that passage shifted? Paul went from his circumstances to the fruit of the Spirit. Don't be intimidated by the flesh. Recognize the Spirit that is behind it. And as human being, you can't help but be impacted by adverse circumstances. I'm not saying that we don't grieve. I'm not saying that we aren't impacted by these things. We are. But as a spiritual being, we can also rise above them and even turn it into an opportunity to glorify God. The key is being able to see beyond the natural and understand what is happening in the spiritual realm. That's why even just as I led in that prayer this morning, you know, Pastor Mark came to us last night, and he was really burdened with this. And we were able to share some good advice that he was able to implement. But also, when the body of Christ is gathered, you know what we did this morning? In the Spirit, we went as a group and backed up whatever God was doing over there. Isn't that cool? Isn't it great to be spiritual beings that are not limited to time and place? Here's the last fill in the blank. Our lives are a paradox. Finishing, we're just going to go through verse 11 today and then I'll pick up next week. Through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as imposters and yet are true. As unknown and yet well known. As dying and yet behold, we live. As punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. So Paul is giving a list of things that he has faced and is facing and saying that at the same time, even though he's experiencing this, the opposite is also true. That's a paradox. Do you know what a paradox is? Let me give you a definition. Baker Encyclopedia of the Bible. Paradox. A form of expression which seems either self-contradictory or absurd but which at another level expresses a fundamental truth. It's often employed to get hearers to think at a deeper and more critical level. So a paradox is a tension between two realities. In this case, it's the tension between earthly reality and spiritual reality. And our lives as Christians are a paradox. Our lives are lived in that tension. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. We live our lives within the limitations of the physical world, but we are really spiritual beings who transcend this world. We have human bodies in an earthly context, but that's not all of who we are. And the more we grow spiritually, the more we realize the ways that we don't really fit in. We're not really from around here. Yes, I'm from around here, but I'm not really from around here. We're on assignment to represent God to the world. And we live in that tension between heaven and earth. Why? So we can help bridge the gap between heaven and earth. And what that means practically is that we are about bringing more of heaven to earth, the kingdom of God. We are released into the world as ambassadors. And it's important that we recognize who we are so that the world will know who Jesus is. Here's 
Here's some questions for reflection this week. So first of all, let me just state the obvious. How do you feel about your body being called a tent? <laughs> now it makes sense, the passage in Isaiah that says, enlarge the place of your tent, right? Have you cared for your spiritual life the way you care for your natural life? And when it comes time to exchange this tent, this natural body, for your spiritual one, will you be trading up? Number two, Paul says, Behold, you're a new creation. So what are you beholding? What are you seeing? How is God transforming you? How does it change the way you see the world around you? How does it change the way you see your circumstances? Number three, I want to tell you, you are an ambassador for Christ. So how well are you representing him? How are you partnering with God in restoring the world? And for those of us who have been doing it a long time especially, how are you navigating the tension of spiritual conflict? Let's stand and worship the Lord as we think about these things.